All right, uh, so we were p uh, page 51 at the top of the page, speaking about uh, the infallibility of the church in worship, in the liturgy. And uh, yes, we just left uh, with the, the quote of Archbishop Lefebvre, who was calling the new mass uh, like a, a bastard rite, meaning some kind of hybrid between the church and, re and the revolution, which obviously doesn't sound too good. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's a blasphemy to think that that would even be possible, but obviously, I mean, he was basically trying to denounce the new mass. Uh, so, on this subject, the Council of Trent in the session 22, Canon 7 declares, uh, look at this, this is very powerful. If anyone says that the ceremonies, vestments, and outward signs which the Catholic Church uses in the celebration of masses are incentives to, pi to impiety rather than the services of piety, let him be anathema. So how you can have this canon of the Council of Trent and issue any serious critic of a new mass without you know, going to the, to the conclusion that it cannot come from the Church? I don't know, because it's very clear. The ceremonies, vestments, outward signs. So if you say that that is incentive to impiety, you're in trouble. The Council of Trent uh, has also defined against the Protestants that the canon of the Mass contains no error. So I have put in the uh, footnotes the Densinger reference, so you can check for yourself. Uh, but here it says, if anyone says that the canon of the Mass contains errors and should therefore be abrogated, let him be anathema. It doesn't speak obviously about the Eucharistic prayers, <laughs> but it's the same, the same principles apply. If you say it's the Mass, you know, it's the ordinary form and blah, 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 then it cannot be wrong, obviously, because that's the liturgy of the Church. So the, and the Mass is the most important rite of I mean, any part of the liturgy, obviously. It's, it's very central to the life of a church, which is why actually most people began to react really with the, the new mass. A lot of people did not do anything with Vatican II or very little because in practical order, it wasn't changing much, at least not yet. And uh, uh, also because it's so um, you know ambiguous and, and tricky. So I guess a lot of people did not pay too much attention to it. But when the new mass came, that's really when people really... Uh, reacted to it very strongly and with reason because it, it is very important. So this obviously entails that the rights given by the church for the administration of the other sacraments are also valid. <laughs> that goes without saying, I mean, imagine. Since the sacraments were instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church to be faithfully kept and administered until the end of times. Uh, so I put a footnote here. It goes without saying that doubting or denying the validity of a universal right of a church is a blasphemy. And logically, it leads one to deny the church's indefectibility. That's just me. There is no uh, canon in the Densinger saying that the sacraments of a church are valid because like, <laughs> it's so obvious, right? So it's not, you, you will actually not find it like black and white in the Densinger. But, I mean, it's obvious that the church actually will have valid sacrament. I mean, it's, it, it is so evident like to say, well, yeah, the church has to be the church. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it's part of what the church is about. Now, there is um, one thing that I just wanted to quote because I actually uh, read it recently. I was reading uh, Mystici Corporis last week. And uh, uh, there is a good quote of Mystici Corporis that I would like to share with you that I haven't included in the notes. I'm probably going to add that. Uh, let me see. Okay, there we go. So this is uh, Popeye the Twelve in Mystici Corporis. He says, Certainly the loving mother, the church, is spotless in the sacraments by which she gives birth to and nourishes her children, in the faith which she has always preserved inviolate, in her sacred laws imposed on all. So, pretty clear. Sacraments, faith, laws. So the three things, again, Doctrine, worship, discipline. He says, certainly. The church, unique means of salvation, is assisted by the Holy Ghost to faithfully accomplish her mission to teach, to rule, and to sanctify the faithful. 
To say that the Church has promulgated to the whole world an evil rite of celebration of the Mass is fundamentally to destroy the mark of holiness of the Catholic Church and to find deficiencies in the assistance of the Holy Ghost. So here I again quote Bishop Lefebvre, compare that with Archbishop Lefebvre. Nous n'acceptons absolument pas cela. Dire que la nouvelle messe est bonne? Non. La messe nouvelle n'est pas bonne. That means we, do ab we absolutely uh, do not accept this to say that the new mass is good. No. The new mass is not good. And he's right, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> there are some consequences that flow from that. So... But he, uh, he was a practical man, right? So he, he was able to, to feel that in the new mass, uh, feel not in the sense of like emotional, but he knew that. He knew something was wrong with the new mass and he was very strongly opposed to it. Uh, uh, I don't know if you heard that, but I was discussing at the table. I was kind of shocked because even in, on uh, SSPX websites, uh, to this day, at least the one in Canada, they have an article denouncing the new mass, which is good, but they classify it among the uh, non-Catholic rites, and they apply to it the canon, you know, the canons from the Code of Canon Law as non-Catholic rites. So basically, they say, yeah, you cannot go because canon this, <laughs> and it's a canon that says you cannot go to a non-Catholic rite, which is shocking. <laughs> I mean, like, if you consider that to be a non-Catholic rite in the strictest, uh, you know, in like even canonically speaking, wow, there are a few consequences that should flow from that, you know? And it's shocking that they would have it like this publicly, you know, they're saying the mass is evil and it's a non-Catholic right and this and that and, and we don't even, we're not even sure it's valid and... Whew, okay, I mean, I agree, but... <laughs> you cannot say that about the church, so you have to make a conclusion. Ah, uh, la la. So, Leo XIII thought authoritatively on this question in his encyclical Satis Cognitum. Uh, I think we already have quoted that, but it's just a summary of everything, right? So it's a very good quote. Uh, he says, and one quote will be enough, like we double quote him because it's, I guess we have done it so much. One quote. Uh, it is then undoubt undoubtedly the office of a church to guard Christian doctrine and to propagate it in its integrity and purity. So, okay, magisterium, teach the faith. But this is not all. The object for which the church has been instituted is not wholly attained by the performance of this duty. Ah, so the, you know, the Pope making an ex cathedra every 200 years, that's not enough? Ah, oh, okay. For since Jesus Christ delivered himself up for the salvation of the human race and, uh, and to this end directed all his teaching and commands, so he ordered the church uh, to strive by the truth of its doctrine to sanctify and to save mankind. But faith alone cannot compass so great, excellent, and important an end. There must be, uh, sorry, there must needs be also the fitting and devout worship of God, which is to be found chiefly in the divine sacrifice and in the dispensation of the sacraments, as well as salutary laws and discipline. All these must be found in the church, since it continues the mission of a Savior forever. I mean, it's obvious, obviously. If you, the, the problem also is a lot of people don't have a, uh, a true view as to what the church is. Uh, I mean, I, I want to preach for myself, but that's the point I was trying to make in the sermon, that the church is our means of salvation. So, I mean, the idea that somehow you have to flee the church or you have to, you know, it's like the church becomes a cross, basically, and you have to, it's a, like a big pain, and you have to flee, and it doesn't make any sense. It's completely absurd. In disciplinary matters, therefore, the church cannot impose an evil law on all the faithful. Actually, the assistance of the Holy Spirit is not limited to me merely prevent the enactment of evil disciplines, but it must be held that the laws of the church are holy and that they infallibly lead the faithful to heaven. So basically, it's not enough to say it's not evil. You positively, you have to say that the laws of the church are actually holy, that they are actually sanctifying. So it's not just that it's like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's not evil, like, we will survive. <laughs> if we pray the rosary enough, we'll survive. No, it, it's actually, it helps you, actually, you know. 
It's like, yeah, you know, the new mass, if you go to the new mass, yeah, it's going to destroy your faith, but, you know, if you do a lot of mental prayer, your rosary, and you read your catechism every day, you might survive. <laughs> no, the, the mass is supposed to help you. you know, it's not supposed to bring you down. Uh, so, who am I? Here I'm quitting journée again. You know, I'm not saying journée is the gospel, far from it. But uh, sometimes it says things in, in, in ways that are very good, so which is why I'm quoting him here. He says, uh, on footnote 97, the great imperatives of the canonical power are not only guaranteed by an absolute infallibility in their principle, in their foundation, in their root, but as a consequence, they also are guaranteed by prudential infallibility in themselves directly and formally. So what does it mean? Um, for example, the, the whole right of the mass is based on theological principles that are basically the, the doctrine of a Council of Trent, you know, concerning the sacrifice of a Mass, what the Mass is, basically, all right? It's based on that, but not only are those things good, but the application in practical order as to how we manifest it uh, externally, like the gestures of a priest and, you know, the different things happening in a Mass, those also have to be good. So, it would not suffice to say that they can never prescribe anything contrary to natural law or evangelical law, but it must be held that they are furthermore wise, prudent, and of benefit. Grave and just reasons, says the Council of Trent, have led the Church to ratify the custom to give communion to the faithful and under only one species. So that was uh, one of the things that the Protestants attacked. So the Church basically said, no, it's fine to have only communion under one species. And the Church went for that option for good reasons. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but... <laughs> Actually, um, at some point, it became, in, in the early church, you will probably see that in history, and I forgot the dates, but in any case, the principle is that at some point, it was actually obligatory to receive communion under both species, and that was against some heretics who were saying, basically, that uh, alcohol is evil, and, and as a consequence, that even the precious blood was, like, at the mass, to use wine for the, the precious blood was evil, and so basically, to act against the heretics, the church was like... <laughs> Okay, you're saying it's evil? All right, everybody does it now. <laughs> okay, and then the opposite was true. When the Protestants said, you absolutely have to receive under both species, the church is against them. The church was like, you say we have to receive uh, under both species? All right, now obligatory, only one species. <laughs> so the church always acted against heresies. So, I mean, again, compare that to Vatican II and the New Mass, it doesn't make any sense, obviously. But uh, the church always acted that way. So for good reasons, the church does that. The same council declares, quote, opportune, praiseworthy, pious, and religious, end quote, the usage of processions of the Blessed Eucharist. So not only is it not bad, it's actually good. The council teaches not only that the canon of the Mass is free from any error, but also that, quote, it contains nothing in it which does not especially diffuse a certain sanctity and piety and raise up to God the minds of those who offer it, end quote. So, I don't know about the Eucharistic prayers <laughs> of the new Mass. <laughs> I, see, I see Michael rolling the eyes. Uh, actually, I do know. I do know. It doesn't work. Uh, the Council affirms that the liturgical ceremonies accompanying the celebration of Mass are suited to, quote, command the majesty of so great a sacrifice, end quote. And, quote, to excite the minds of the faithful to the contemplation of the most sublime matters which lie hidden in this sacrifice, end quote. So, in the new Mass, it's so hidden, you don't even find it. <laughs> 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 uh, it's gone. <laughs> it's just too well. so it's, They hid it pretty well. So, anyway. It's very clear, and again, nobody contests that. Like, it's not as if it was a disputed question of theology that the liturgy of, of the church has to, be you know, has to be good or something. It's not even disputed, you know? So, I have no clue how you can criticize a new mass and not draw the proper conclusion. So, it's just, it's beyond me. Yes? Well, then, uh, I guess in that case, that person is convinced that the new mass 
is not bad, basically. So then I would argue concerning the new mass itself. I would not, I mean, for him, that's fine. Like everything we have said, I guess, would still be fine because he will say the new mass is, is okay, it's good. Uh, so then I would just argue about the, the, the very nature of the new mass itself and, uh, you know, bring the different arguments uh, concerning the fact that they completely changed the doctrine of what the mass is about mainly. And I think that's the, the main thing is that it's no longer a sacrifice. As a matter of fact, from my experience also, because you will see as a priest, you deal with, uh, with people obviously, so um, converse from different backgrounds, but when people come from the Nobu Sordo and they see the, the traditional mass, usually they're a little bit surprised and you know, very usually are uh, sympathetic to it, but when you explain to them that the big difference, well, really the big difference is actually the, the nature of it, that it's actually a sacrifice. Usually they look at you like, with eyes like this, like, what are you speaking about? Sacrifice? <laughs> like, what sacrifice? They don't even know it's a sacrifice. It's to that point. Obviously, it, it's, you know, some people do because they read themselves and they, they study their faith and they think, okay, it still applies to the new mass. But in practical order, most people, they don't even know that it is a sacrifice because the liturgy itself doesn't convey that anymore. And it's very evident when you study the, the, the new mass. So I would, uh, I think I would give them Fauci Chikara's book. <laughs> and, uh, or the, just maybe the Otavian intervention as, as a start, you know, uh, to, to, to study that. Yes, uh, Truf? Father Marshall? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow, that's bad. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> okay, well, there you have it. <laughs> I mean, the fact that this is possible, like that a priest could do f go through 12 years of training without knowing that at least somehow it's supposed to be a sacrifice. Wow, all right. But, I mean, I'm I'm shocked, but at the same time, well, what do you expect? Well, yes? The new mass, is it an absence of reflecting Catholic dogma, or does it actually reflect the modern, modernist principles? Uh, good point. It's, uh, yeah, well, it, it does reflect the modernist principles, and Protestant principles, too. Yeah. Good point. It's not just that it's a... Uh, and the bishop actually, uh, the other day, we were correcting the things on the website, you know. So the bishop actually said, here, be more precise, in the sense that I basically said the new mass was expunged of everything Catholic. Uh, concerning the sacrifice and all of this, but it's true that it's not just that. In the sense that it's not just like oh, uh, it's it's not as good. Like it, you know, it's a little bit like a uh, jus de chaussette. Your coffee is not as strong, right? <laughs> you know something about that, right? <laughs> uh, but it's actually that <laughs> it's not coffee anymore. You know, <laughs> it's like it's actually it's like orange juice <laughs> or something. You know, so that's a good point. And it's not just. It's not just, uh, you know, um, a theology of, or, or doctrine that has been diluted, but actually it's a different doctrine. And uh, it, it's very clear even for the Novus Ordo people, at least, again, you have conservatives that try to, you know, put everything together. But for people who are honest and uh, they are happy about it, they just say it very openly. Uh, Remember, I don't know if you recall that uh, Mas, uh, Massimo Fagioli, who was basically saying, you can have the Latin Mass, but you cannot have the, the uh, theology of a Latin Mass. It's exactly that. And Bergoglio also, is, that's why he does uh, Traditionis Custodes right now, because people actually <laughs> going to the Latin Mass believe in the traditional doctrine concerning the Mass, that it is a sacrifice. So he's like, oh, we can't let that happen. You know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know why, because, let's say, let's see, if triads are heretics, they're still in communion of saints. So how does that work? I, I don't know. Like, his ecclesiology is a little mixed up, right? <laughs> yeah. Somebody else has, uh, had another question? Or? No? All right. Okay, next, uh, next point, which is another... <laughs> another Disputed without being disputed, because again, all theologians agree on that, and you only had to arrive in the 2000 something to find people who would not agree anymore, because they want to, you know, uh, somehow find a way to say Paul VI was not duly canonized or whatever. So, solemn canonizations of saints. The infallibility of a church in the canonizations of saints is a corollary of the previous point. 
Indeed, through the canonization of saints, the Church implicitly presents to the faithful a rule of morals, since it proposes the canonized person as an example to imitate. So that is a very important point because uh, recently discussing with uh, you know, we saw the people who were trying to save the canonization, they were just saying, no, 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 canonization is only the fact that the person is in heaven. But what's the point of the canonization then? The point of the canonization is to give you somebody to, to venerate and to imitate. So that's the goal of you know, canonizations. So, and that's why it's actually infallible. Uh, it's not because it's not just, oh, somebody is in heaven, okay, good for him, then what? <laughs> no, it's so that he, you know, that saint be proposed as a model. Uh, so the Dominican theologian De Groot defines canonization as, quote, the ultimate and definitive sentence by which the church declares that someone has led a holy life and has been received into heaven and proposes him to all the faithful for veneration and invocation. So you have three points here, all right? Holy life, the fact that eventually the person went into heaven and uh, proposed to the faithful for veneration and invocation. It is an absolutely definitive sentence. We're speaking about something definitive here. And therefore, we're not talking here about beatification, which not being a definitive sentence does not pertain to faith, either divine or ecclesiastical, although it would be rash to challenge a beatification. It would still be a mortal sin, basically, but uh, it's strictly speaking, for the sake of the argument here, we're going to say, all right, we are only applying that to canonizations. St. Thomas says that uh, canonization is a kind of profession of faith and is therefore connected to faith itself. It is therefore subject to the special and supernatural providence by which Christ has promised to be always with his church. So he says here, the honor which we pay to the saints is a kind of profession of faith by which we believe in the glory of the saints. So St. Thomas did believe in infallibility or in that matter. The church cannot err in determining things which pertain to the provision of faith, and she is therefore infallible in the canonization of saints. Moreover, if it were otherwise, the entire veneration of saints would be called into question, since no authority outside the church could determine whether or not a saint was properly canonized. So if you, and we point that out all the time to SSPX, like if you contest that GP2 or Paul the Sixth or John Twenty Third, or whatever, is a saint, then with the same principle you could contest St. Pius X. Why would he be, inf uh, why, why would his canonization be infallible if you are destroying the principle by which canonizations are infallible? So, uh, here I quote Le Pissier because uh, he has a few, um <laughs> Uh, well, you will see for yourself. <laughs> He's not too happy with people who contest that. Uh, yes, truth. It's not defining it. It's, it, it only gives. Uh, basically, it's a canonization, but only for a particular church. So, in a sense, it's not definitive. Uh, the church says, makes a judgment that this person has led a holy life. Uh, it's most likely in heaven, and it proposes that person to veneration of a people, usually a particular church. So you will, that, that saint, or sorry, that uh, beatified person, or saint, or well, holy person, uh, would usually be um, in, um, uh, celebrated in a, in a local church. So for example, in, in France, we, we have a number, I'm sure in, in Spain, obviously, you, you must have also a number of them. Uh, so it's, it's <laughs> uh, so it's not a universal uh, veneration, basically. It, it is allowed for some places, yes? Right, because his canonization was done by John Twenty Third, so I don't know what to think about that. But he, I mean, he was definitely a holy, a holy man. There's no question there. Um, but yeah, but it's it's uh, because it goes through steps. So you have a first process of beatification, which is not as stringent as the one of canonization, and it's not a definitive decision. So. But to, I mean, I don't know any example of like a, a beatification that was undone or that was, you know, later on they realized, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Never happened. Not that I'm aware of, you know. So, yes? 
Yeah, that's another question, though, uh, in the sense that, I mean, I'm not saying he's right <laughs> at all. All right, he's wrong. But uh, he was not canonized or beatified by a process uh, the, like we have today, right? It, she's from the early church. So a lot of saints that are in the martyrology uh, were considered saints by the church. It's more, it, it would rather belong to universal ordinary magisterium, basically, than, uh, than to uh, like a solemn definition. But yes, he did. Uh, he, uh, he obviously had a lot of modernist tendencies, so he uh, put into doubt a lot of things, and Saint Philomena had to go. Yeah. Yes? I don't think so. Because, <laughs> I mean, she's not, she was not, as far as I'm aware, in the universal calendar. Uh, she's in the missile, you will find um, uh, Saint Philomena, I think, in the in the part for the, the, the mass pro aliquibus logis, I'm pretty sure. Um, but she was always considered a saint, and she, it's, it's not just like a, you know, blessed or something. Also, she's in martyrology. I doubt greatly that the Pope could ever do it. Because we might see something about the martyrology. Basically, it is not impossible that in the martyrology uh, there be things like, for example, um, uh, a saint that would be f uh, celebrated twice, in the sense that he maybe had a name in one area and he had another name in another area, and they both kept traditions about that saint, so he celebrated twice and nobody knows it's the same person as another one. That seems possible according to some principles. What is also possible is that two be united as one. That also is possible. So, like, from the part of history, basically, it's not impossible that there are some facts that, you know, kind of got mixed up a little bit, but the saints that are in the martyrology, Normally they are saints. That, that's it. Like you cannot just take them out, you know. But we will uh, maybe we'll see that uh, if we have time, uh, an article on the uh, martyrology uh, concerning the uh, the other principles that that uh, are relevant to that. So there won't be anything evil also in the martyrology, uh, but it doesn't mean that every name in the martyrology will definitely be like a solemn canonization either. It's a little bit in between, so. The same for the uh, the legends of the breviary. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything is of faith, like everything contained in the breviary concerning a saint, every deed of his life. Uh, but it has a very strong authority, and you're not supposed to reject that, obviously. You, you, you know. But it could be it could be ref at least for the let's say the the history lesson of the life of a saint in the breviary, there could be some mistakes, all right, in the sense factual, okay. But there won't be anything, obviously. Uh, essential. Yes. What do you mean, legendary aspects? Yes. So again, it's. Uh, first off, a, a lot of that would be historical research, and if it. Like if it, if it's just private authors that you know say something about a saint, um, like Butler or you know Le Bolandis or something like that, it's not even it does not belong to the church's magisterium. If it is in the martyrology or the breviary, it has a way stronger value. But even then, as I said, it doesn't make a dogma out of every fact. So, but the essential will be true. And sometimes some facts made it into the liturgy. Like um, uh, many times, the the collect of a mass of a saint will be worded to reflect a little bit what happened in, in the life of a saint. That was the case this morning, but it's the case uh, a lot of times. So I wouldn't say it becomes our faith, but to doubt it would be at least definitely rash and a mortal sin, I would say that. At least that. You know. Okay, now let's go back to canonization. So Cardinal Lepicier uh, didn't like too much the idea of uh, reputing, uh, rejecting canonization, so... <laughs> Let's see how he phrases it. <laughs> he says, things being so, to affirm that the church can err in the canonization of saints is not only erroneous, rash, scandalous, and impious, but even formally heretical. All right. Firstly, certainly it is erroneous since it opposes the common sense of the faithful. Secondly, it is rash since it is contrary to the general sentence of theologians. Thirdly, it is scandalous since it insinuates into the minds of the faithful that a canonized man may be tormented in hell. Fourthly, it is impious, since it attacks religion and the worship due to the saints. 
but we said, fifthly, that it is formally heretical since it opposes the certitude of revelation. So you have the reference here uh, and the footnote. And he says, uh, I say here, Cardinal Lépicier therefore considers that denying the infallibility of a canonization of saints is heretical, and he specifies further that this goes against ecclesiastical faith, since it log logically amounts to denying the assistance of the Holy Ghost promised to the Church. We'll speak about ecclesiastical faith very soon, so don't worry about that. Um, but he says it's heretical. Okay, now we get into something very interesting. Father Salaveri affirms that the infallibility of canonization can even be considered as now implicitly defined since Pope P Pius XI and Pius XII explicitly affirmed it on multiple occasions in the decretal letters of canonizations. So here I gave you a few samples and you have the, um, it's, I think it's important for you to have it, that's why I, I gave it to you. Uh, I gave you the quotes from the Acta. So that's in Latin, it's from the Acta. I took it from the library, okay? And uh, in the notes itself, you just have, you just have like, you know, very short quotes, but it's good to have the context. So if you want to look for yourself and see that I didn't make it up, uh, you have the Latin. You also have the exact reference in the book. So you can go in the library and check for yourself. You have that? All right. So you see every time you have uh, uh, the, the litere decretales of canonization of such and such a saint, the pope, the date, the reference in the acta, and an extensive quote so that you can see that I, di I did not take uh, the things out of context. But we will <coughs> look at the notes where I, I provide a translation of the, um, the important parts. So in 1933, Pope Pius XI affirmed regarding the canonization of Saint André Hubert Fournet, quote, as supreme master of the Catholic Church, we have uttered with these words an infallible sentence. Boom. And then he goes on and he defines it. Okay? In 1934, the decretal letters of the canonization of uh, Saint Marie Michel of the Blessed Sacrament stated, quote, as supreme universal master of the Church of Christ, we solemnly pronounced from the chair of St. Peter an infallible sentence by these words. And then he goes on again. So here I put notice that the supreme pontiff explicitly says that he pronounced a sentence ex cathedra from the chair of St. Peter. These are the actual words he uses in Latin, ex cathedra. So it's very clear, you will see from all of us quotes, it, they very clearly say that uh, the canonizations of saints are definitions, that they are solemn, that they are infallible, and that they are ex cathedra. Very clear. It, and they say it many, many times. So it's not just like uh, something taken out of context. Uh, the Acts of Pope Pius XII also indicate in several instances uh, that in the canonization of saints, he was pronouncing an infallible ex cathedra decision. So look at mm, the footnote uh, 104. Uh, canonization of Saint Gemma Galgani and of, and of Saint Mary of Saint Euphrasie Pelletier, Nos Universalis Catholici Ecclesiae Magister ex cathedra, again, una super petrum domini fu voce fundata, falinesiam uh, anc sententiam solenita ische pronunciavimus verbis. I'm surprised I did not translate that, but falinesiam anc sententiam, that is a, a sentence that cannot fail. It means infallible, all right? The second one, canonization of Saint Nicholas of. Uh, I don't know how to say that properly in English or in German, whatever, but we say flu. <laughs> what is it? Flue? All right. So, Saint Nicholas of Flue. Anyway, look at this. Ipse sedens in cathedra mitramque gestans. So, here the mitre. De plenitudine apostolici ministeri solemniter sic pronunciavit. So, here it says solemniter. After that, canonization of Saint uh, Michel Garicoitz and of Saint Elizabeth Bichet des Ages. Um, so all of those French names, yeah. Uh, I don't see any Spanish. Eh? I don't know what's happened to what happens to Spain, right? What? It's not Spanish. The there was one. Okay. Maybe All right. <laughs> uh, anyway, et celo superna lux pontificem maximum colustrat quiam inerantem sententiam suam laturus est. So he's about to make now his 
uh, inherent sentence, basically infallible, right? And uh, he, look at this, because, because this is actually good. It continues. Celiculis ishe, quos petrus in pio vivens, loquens, decernens, sanctitudinis in fula mox est decoraturus, nos nostraque omnia supplici prece concredamus. So the person who is actually writing the, the decree, he says, le, let us, as that we now have witnessed that, let's, let us concredamus. That means believe, but firmly. It means to, like, basically, this is it. We have to believe that. After that, uh, canonization of St. Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort, uh, seek definivit. So you have the, uh, he was defined. Uh, canonization of St. Catherine Labouré uh, in Cathedra Seren, seek solemniter pronunciavit. So solemniter again. All right. Enough on that. Let's go back to the notes. So at the top, uh, where we left, second line. And it is not necessary for the sovereign pontiff to declare that he is indeed making an infallible pronouncement in order that a given canonization be in fact infallible. So what I'm trying to, to say here is, in the acta, uh, when you have those uh, decreta letters, it basically, you have the Pope speaking, right? So he's saying, and most of them he's speaking himself, He's saying, uh, by these words, we pronounce an infallible sentence, and then he goes on. All right. But then he says it himself. Ah, by the way, I'm going to be infallible, and then he goes on. So, obviously, uh, our, our people are going to say, hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. He said he would be infallible, therefore he is, but Bergoglio didn't say he's infallible. So, therefore, he's not. But that's not actually true, because, uh, and I put you an example here of Pope Pius XII making a canonization very simply. No problem, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say he's infallible, he just makes it. Two years later, he comes back on that event and he says that when he did that, he was infallible. You see what I mean? So he did not say it at the time, but he said it afterwards. Do you understand the point I'm trying to make? So there you have the reference. Um, Pope Isaac XII's acta render this point very clear. The canonization of Saint John de Brito Saint Bernardin Realino, maybe, is it Spanish? I don't know. Saint, John, uh, Saint Joseph Cafaso, pronounced on June 22nd, 1947, appears for the first time in the Acta Apostolice Celis in 1947, so the year of the canonization, in a rather descriptive way, then the Most Holy Father being seated, solemnly pronounced from the chair of Saint Peter, and then goes on for the honor, and honor the usual formula. Um, so you have the Latin in the footnote. The Holy Father does not say here that he is infallible, although this is evident, <laughs> except for a few people. But two years later, remembering this event, uh, Pius XII explicitly affirms that he was then infallible. So let's see what he said. Being seated on the chair, fulfilling the infallible magisterium of Peter, we have solemnly pronounced. So he's saying, if you do a canonization, you are fulfilling the infallible magister of Peter. It's very clear. Yes? One thing about Saint Germania, but it says here, um, Where here? She was the I'm looking on Wikipedia. Okay. Wikipedia? <laughs> Is that here? <laughs> Wikipedia says, uh, 1837, the church was canonized, and the act of the ordinary sacred magisterium, that is stated by Pope Gregory the Sixth. She was canonized? Oh, okay. What? He said, he said, wait, 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 he said liturgically canonized by an, an ordinary act. So I suspect that just means he uh, had the mass promulgated, right? Most likely. You done? All right. So I guess he, he just had something against her and basically decided to get rid of her from the calendar. Well, what I remember is that he basically doubted the history of it. That's what I remember, but I would be honest with you, I haven't researched that for, you know, very, very s deeply, but... Uh, well, uh, what do you mean by the Catholic Church? Like, uh, what, what, like... Like what, in 2002 or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> All right. 
difficult to say because um, it's difficult to say that would be like a heresy. But it's very odd. I would say that at least, uh, for sure. I don't think a pope would ever do that. Because if it were like a solemn canonization, that would be that would be easy to answer. But you would have to basically prove that the whole church really believed that this saint was a saint. So uh, maybe you can make the point. That just uh, I don't know. I would have to research it more. But imagine, <laughs> imagine like you're just getting rid of saints in the calendar, like. Uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, that doesn't help for heaven, I would say that. So, especially, I mean, Saint Philomena, after, <laughs> after all of the miracles happening in the life of the Curie of Ars, it's, it's like, you have to be so blind, I mean, it's incredible. Yes? Right. And obviously, he also was part of it, but still, it, it did, you know, it did come from Saint Philomena. Uh, God would not have done miracles for Saint Philomena if she was not a saint, you know. Then another altar would have worked basically for the Curie of Ars, another saint, but so <laughs> no, I think uh, I mean anyway. John twenty third. Just we say this is his name and that's it. It explains everything. <laughs> uh, I mean remember what he said about uh he said the same thing about the, the, the assumption. I think I told you but when the assumption was declared the dogma, basically he was like, Ah why you know, why? Like, as if it were something that the church should not have done. Like it's bad for ecumenism and blah blah blah. So that was his spirit. All right. Um, also known for using uh, modernist uh, Duchenne in in the seminary for teaching. He was a history teacher. So that explains part of it. In a sense, he was a modernist history teacher. So obviously, he went into modernist history things and began to contest everything from the point of view of history. So. It's not a big surprise that he just decided to uh, get rid of some saints. Uh, okay, and he denied that he was using Duchenne. And even the even his apologists today, who write his biography, say, "Well, uh, he did lie here. <laughs> so he's a saint, but he lied. Uh, so for something very serious, obviously. In any case, let's go back to uh, the notes. So according to the teaching of both uh, both Pope. Pius XI and Pius XII canonizations are therefore solemn and infallible ex cathedra definition. There is no way you can uh, deny that. And the footnote uh, here, I add a few more. Uh, one could probably find equivalent teachings in the Acts of other Roman Pontiffs. Cardinal Lipicier indicates, for example, that such was the teaching of Pope Cle Clement VII in the canonization of Saint Antoninus of Florence. Uh, so he said, Ait Deum non passurum fore militantem ecclesiam suam erare. So that is Clement VII here. And the Groot also gives a few one. Um, okay. On the other hand, the infallibility of canonization, uh, no, sorry, I missed something. Uh, okay, the infallibility of canonizations can no, uh, can no longer be questioned. We should therefore not be surprised if theologians conclude that questioning a canonization is a very serious mortal sin against the faith. On the other hand, the infallibility of canonizations does not depend on the canonical inquiry that precedes it, nor on the value of a testimony is given, as any good textbook of ecclesiology indicates. So I give you gave you the reference here. Maybe I should perhaps have in included them because actually I realize some people actually claim that to this day. Um, and also, actually yesterday I was reading um, uh, what is his name, Gregory the Sixteenth book. You know the book that Bishop gave me. <laughs> like this big book. Uh, it actually has uh, four full pages on that issue. So uh, I might. Translate that and uh, include that in the in the notes. Yes. Yes, because do not think as the charism of infallibility as a prophecy uh, or as prophet prophetic spirit. In the sense, the Pope does not get up in the morning and it's like, oh, this saint got in heaven. <laughs> like he has like a illumination. It could happen, I mean, but normally it's not the way it happens. So usually he has to use the ordinary means, basically. Th what the guarantee is about is that when he takes the final decision, we know for sure that he's right. But he has to do it through ordinary means. Okay? 
Uh, so on the other hand, the inf okay, uh, nor on the value of the testimonies, no, 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 sorry, I already read that. The assistance of, of the Holy Ghost is such that it prevents the final judgment of the church from being false. For the faithful, the definitive sentence of the church is a guarantee, and they are not asked to verify that the sacred congregation of rites has done its work well, which, in addition to being absurd, is clearly impossible. So you would destroy any uh, certainty in any canonization whatsoever, because you're basically saying, well, maybe the church was wrong. Well, if a church can be wrong with GP2, the church could be wrong with St. Pius X, and you know, it's like, where do you stop? What is the limit? Also, uh, as Gregory XVI points out, it's not a question of, it's not, it's not just like a natural uh, process of reasoning, okay, this is proven, whatever. No, it, it is something of a higher order. So you can put all of the effort in the world, you will never attain to the degree of a certainty of faith. Like even if you, you know, do all the studies you can about a person, you, the most you can have will be a certainty, a natural certainty, but it will never get to the point of a certainty of faith. So it, it's a, like it's a from another, you know, it's on another level. So you can do all the effort you want, it doesn't change anything. So, uh, but I might translate some of uh, his, uh, the, uh, from this book because it's actually very good. He has a very lengthy uh, uh, answer to that objection. Which, by the way, he wrote in 1799. <laughs> so it's not a new objection. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you can go and check L'EPC uh, uh, or um, the good. I perhaps should have included that in the notes here. Maybe I will add that next time. So definitive approval of religious orders now. That's not too disputed because I don't think the Novus Ordo has done any any new uh, definitive approbation like that. Like it means like the big orders of the church, like Dominicans, you know, Jesuits, Benedictines. So with regard to the definitive approval of religious orders, the principles are fundamentally the same. The church leads the faithful without error to salvation by the way of evangelical perfection, since this concerns morals in matters of which the magisterium of a church enjoys infallibility. We are discussing the value of a definitive and solemn approbation of religious orders and not a simple experimental approbation nor a simple permission of a bishop or of the Holy See. So most of the time you have congregations of nuns, for example, like hundreds of them, and they are either they have something from the bishop by which they are established or even sometimes from the Holy See, but it's not a definitive approbation. So it means, okay, you can do that, uh, but it's not definitive. It does not canonize, as it were, that rule of life. Okay, so then it does not fall into this category. So here you really have to think about the big religious orders, Dominicans, Franciscans, Benedictines, okay? Not just like a small congregation of, uh, or even sometimes big congregations, but which is only like a congregation basically. You have to think about the big orders of the church. The pontifical decree is definitely, uh, definitively approving the religious orders proposed to the universal church a stable way of life according to a rule in which uh, to certainly acquire evangelical perfection. So that's why it is infallible. The church is basically saying, if you follow that rule, you will be a saint. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I forgot who said that, but there are a number of popes who said, find me one Dominican who follow perfectly his rule and I, canonize, I will canonize him right away. Because if you do follow the rule perfectly, then that means you are a saint actually. Because the dis what the rule says is exactly what uh, should uh, what uh, religious should do basically, and usually, obviously, there will be uh, you know little uh, breaking of rules, and and it's not just obviously it's not to follow it like a, a Pharisee in the sense literally, but if you don't put your spirit into it, then you're not following it, obviously. So uh, this approval is a doctrinal judgment concerning the way of life considered in itself. The prudential judgment regarding the expediency of an approval or a suppression of a religious order does not seem to necessarily be the best possible. If you think about the suppression of the Jesuits, for example, was that a good idea? You know, you can discuss about it, most likely <laughs> I would say no. But in fact, the Pope did it, so the Jesuits submitted. So they didn't claim that they had some special charism or anything like that, like uh, some people are trying to do right now to, to not be suppressed. <laughs> Imagine the Jesuits, <laughs> the order of the Jesuits got suppressed and they just obeyed. So, 
I think um, it sh it shows that the pop can do can do that if he wants to. Uh, all right, let's just finish with that quote of Leo the Thirteenth here. In the encyclical Satis Cognitum, he says, the church alone offers to the human race that religion, that state of absolute perfection, which Christ wished, as it were, to be incorporated in it. And it alone supplies those means of salvation, which accord with the ordinary concepts of providence. So, so it doesn't, you see, it alone, like the church alone, supplies the means of salvation. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, obviously it, it does contradict Vatican too.